Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring future creators, and for all those that like really great stories, uh, I'm Ira Pastor, again, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this ride. So um, according to the U.S. National Survey on Drug Use and Health, uh, in 2017, an estimated 20 million American adults were battling some type of substance abuse disorder. Uh, drug abuse and addiction in the United States is estimated to cost over $700 billion annually in terms of lost workplace productivity, healthcare expenses, and crime-related costs. Globally, the numbers are further off the charts. More specifically on a topic that we hear quite a lot about today, uh, in the area of opioids, you know, class of drugs that includes the illicit drug heroin, but also the illicit prescription painkillers, oxycodone, hydrocodone, codeine, fentanyl, and so forth. Of that 20 million, uh, it's estimated that around 2 million have a substance abuse disorder involving prescription pain relievers, and over half a million have a substance use disorder involving heroin, with tens of thousands of overdose deaths per year. Uh, we're seeing an increase in infants born, uh, opiate dependent, uh, as well as a spreading of infectious diseases, including HIV and hepatitis C in these populations. Uh, in 2019, uh, the most effective opiate withdrawal methods still involve substituting and tapering with opioid agonists, uh, such as methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, and the best outcomes are primarily seen with such treatments combined with the appropriate psychosocial interventions. Uh, but most thought leaders in the space, you know, are pretty much on the same page that we need much better agents uh, to impact the complex brain changes related to addiction, addictions of all sorts. And our pharmacotherapeutic armamentarium right now is, is rather small still in this area. So for today's guest, I could think of no one better to come on and talk with us for a while about this topic, take us into the future, than Dr. Deborah Mash. Uh, Dr. Mash is the professor of neurology and molecular and cellular pharmacology at the Leonard Miller School of Medicine and director of the Brain Endowment Bank at the University of Miami. Uh, as a neuroscientist, lecturer, and inventor, Dr. Mash has dedicated more than 25 years in a research career to unlocking the secrets of the human brain. Uh, she is nationally recognized as a leading researcher in neuroscience and brain disorders, playing pivotal roles, uh, publishing 300 plus published studies, investigating aging, neurodegeneration, neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, and she works with a team of neuroscientists, pharmacologists, forensic toxicologists, clinical researchers to bring many basic discoveries from the bench to the patient's bedside. In the early 1990s, um, Dr. Mash was involved in uh, a US FDA IND that was truly unique for its time, uh, where she was granted this IND to permit her to do studies on an addiction stopping capabilities of a, a DEA Schedule I substance known as Ibogaine. Uh, and for those that may not be familiar with DEA scheduling, Schedule I drugs or substances are technically defined as those that at the time had no accepted medical use or a high potential of abuse, including substances like heroin, LSD, ecstasy, and so forth. Dr. Mash and her colleagues had previously uh, discovered through their extensive work in both the pharmacology and pharmacokinetics of Ibogaine, uh, despite having you know, rather intense visionary effects, uh, that it actually serves as a really interesting prodrug uh, that when metabolized turns into a substance known as 12-hydroxyabogamine or noribogaine that had rather profound effects on binding to opiate and other sort of pleasure receptors in the brain, nicotinic, serotonin, NMDA, and so forth, to help block the withdrawal effects for very long periods of time and allow drug addicts to properly come down off these drugs and ultimately help to remodel and in essence normalize the brain's neurochemistry and neurobiology. Uh, in addition to her roles here, she serves as the CEO and founder of a company called Demrix, which is a development stage biotech company that's looking to clinically develop and commercialize technologies around noribogaine for both addiction with withdrawal and other CNS indications. Uh, Dr. Mash is a member of the Society for Neuroscience, the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, the Research Society on Alcoholism, the American Academy of Neurology, the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics, and the International Society of Brain Research. Uh, a lot of stuff here. So with all that, Dr. Mash, thanks so much for, for spending your time to come on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's, it's a true 
and our pleasure having you here. So, you know, we typically start off this show by giving our guests the floor just to talk about you. Um, your background, where you grew up, how you got interested in health, medicine, neuroscience, and ultimately uh, the path that, that brings you in 2019 to really the epicenter of uh, addiction therapy, neuroscience, neuropharmacology. Uh, really want to hear all about it because it's a fascinating journey. Well, the journey has been a long one, as we both know, because you and I go back many years and have crossed paths more than one time, Absolutely. both of our professional careers. But um, neuroscience has always been my passion, and science has been my passion since I was a child. I was uh, one of those nerdy little girls who uh, participated in the science club, the math club, the rocket club, and uh, always had a, a deep love of science. And um, my passion for brain science, for neuroscience, really goes back to my undergraduate days. But on, on, my, on my path to where I am today, neurochemistry, neuropharmacology is where I ultimately landed. And my work at the University of Miami first began as a graduate student in the field of neuropharmacology. And back then I was working in the Alzheimer field and I was really at uh, the front end of that disorder and trying to understand and identify the chemical aspects of that disease and what we could do from a pharmaceutical standpoint to treat it. That led me to Harvard where I, I was very, um, very privileged to complete my fellowship at Beth Israel Hospital with uh, Professor Marcel Messalam in the department of the late Dr. Norm Geshwin. It was really one of the top neurology, behavioral neurology groups in the world. And working with Dr. Messalam, we uh, advanced again more of our understanding of what is the cholinergic nervous system. Mm -hmm. With that background, I then was invited to come back and join the faculty at the University of Miami, and I became an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology, and I had a secondary appointment in pharmacology at the University of Miami. And there I began, and my career was off to a great start because I had funded my first NIH grants, and um, my laboratory was, was on the up. When I get to Miami, things change. Here I am with a laboratory to study Alzheimer's disease, but Miami is hit hard by the cocaine epidemic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because of our close proximity to the Caribbean and the transshipment routes of cocaine from South America through the Bahamian Corridor into Miami, we got hit first. Sure. Cocaine exposed infants, cocaine intoxication deaths, the phenomenon of cocaine-related excited delirium. Mm. And a colleague of mine from the CDC, who I had known from my undergraduate days, was in Miami, came in trying to understand why they were seeing this increase in drug-related deaths to report back to the CDC. And there was no understanding because it looked like people were dying with what they thought were recreational blood levels of cocaine on board. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my collaboration with Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Department. And that department was fantastic. That was the late Joe Davis. Dr. Davis was a pioneer in the field of forensic medicine. And the deputy medical examiner was Dr. Charles Wetley. And Dr. Charles Wetley was working in the area of cocaine and cocaine-related excited delirium people who would exhibit this Hulk Hogan-like strength, mm -hmm. and they would die in custody. And so this was very controversial. So they said, well, you know, there's this woman who has a brain bank, Dr. Deborah Mash. She's in the Department of Neurology. Somebody needs to talk to her because we need to figure out what's going on. We don't have a cause and mechanism of death for most of these cases. We need to work with her. Maybe it's something in the drug. Maybe it's a toxin in the drug and the cocaine that was coming into South Florida. We thought that for a while. Something's going on here, and it probably the mechanism is in the brain. I go over, I meet with them, I see a friend, my old friend, Dr. Jim Ruttenberg from the CDC in Atlanta. He had trained at Emory. Mm -hmm. 
and I knew him when I, as I said, as an undergraduate. So this was an old friend and I listened to the story and I thought, this is fantastic. I said to Jim, can I get, come up? Can I meet your boss at the CDC? I want to get your data. I travel up. He introduces me to the boss. The boss gives us permission to uh, collaborate. And I write my first grant to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Mm -hmm. I'd never published in the area of drug abuse. I went into a room, locked myself in a room, came out with a grant application, submitted it. It was called CNS Mechanisms and Cocaine-Related Sudden Death, and we were funded on a first submission. So my life changed. Like, overnight, Absolutely. I was now in drug abuse research. I come back in to my colleagues, and I said, wow, we got the grant, put everybody in the room, and I said, now we need to make sure we do the right science. Mm -hmm. How are we going to proceed? And a wonderful colleague collaborator who was head of a toxicology, Dr. Lee Hearn, said to me, Deborah, we need to look at coca ethylene. And I said, coca what? Coca what? <laughs> and he says, you know, it's the ethyl homolog of cocaine that's formed when you drink and use cocaine in combination. And I, I said, no, I don't know that. Draw it on the blackboard. So he sketched up the molecule on the blackboard for me. And I said, can you make it? And he said, yeah. In six months, we had national press. We made the cover of every newspaper, and I'm not exaggerating, because the Society for Neuroscience gave us a press release, and we were the Miami Vice metabolite. <laughs> so this is action item number two. And we were getting so much publicity, it was really ridiculous. We, um, Science Magazine wrote us up as the Miami Vice metabolite, Again, I mentioned we made the AP wire service. We were just, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. We couldn't stop getting press. And meanwhile, Miami's, you know, South Florida is suffering from dead bodies and, and babies born and, and, and homes wrecked and, you know, the rest of it. Crime, mm -hmm. HIV, AIDS, all of it. All of, all of the scourge of drug addiction. So here I am. Um, getting all this publicity, we're very proud of ourselves, and I'm traveling around, and my, the former um, president of the University of Miami, Tad Foote, a really remarkable human being, comes to me and he said, Deborah, I want you to lecture to the Coalition of Drug-Free America. You may remember sure. that movement. And I, your president asks you to do that. You say, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I go and I give a lecture. And at that lecture, I'm talking about cocaethylene. And at the end of my lecture, I'm mobbed by a whole group of people. But a black gentleman came up to me that day and said, Dr. Mash, have you heard about this drug from Africa that can be used to wean people off of cocaine and heroin? And I looked at him and I went, no, I've never heard of that. And he's trying to really, he's, you know, very excited about this and he wanted to explain it to me. And he's explaining it to me and there's a whole crowd of people around me all trying to talk to me at the same time and there are reporters there and all this stuff. And I, I think I was, you know, probably very abrupt with this man uh, because I, I didn't know what he was talking about. And he's talking about some drug that comes from Africa and it's a, used uh, spiritually in Africa and the whole thing sounded just... It was not what I wanted to hear on that day. It was, I, I just wasn't listening. And I, I said, no, I've never heard that. And I said, sir, thank you so much for telling me about this, but you, I, I have so many people here who want to talk to me. So thank you. You know, I appreciate it. And <laughs> goodbye. First time I heard about Ibogaine. Second time I heard about Ibogaine, I went to the college on the problems of drug dependence. And I was giving a, I was invited to give a lecture on cocaethylene. So I get my lecture on cocaethylene. I'm pretty bored with cocaethylene now. Okay, we've been, you know, getting all this publicity media. I've been lecturing mm -hmm. on it. And it's like, you know, I'm more on to the next, what's next here? We got to come up with a solution. Okay, this is something we've described. It's more lethal. It's more sure. rewarding. People like the combination of coke and booze. Okay, I get it. How are we going to deal with this? What, what's the solution here? What are we learning? I hadn't really played around with my program, so I didn't really know what was, who was talking or what was going on at the meeting. So I said, I'm going to go sit in the back of this room. I'm going to look at my program. I'll listen to whatever's going on in this session. It was, I think, a cocaine session, and uh, I'll relax. And there was a man there by the name of Stanley Glick. 
Professor Glick from Albany, who had these rats, these little rats who self-administer drugs. And he was giving these rats this drug from Africa. Mm -hmm. Now I've heard it twice. And the rats would stop taking cocaine and heroin. And I, I looked at the screen. I'm watching this. I put my program down and I went, that's the same drug that that other man was talking to me about. Now I've heard it twice. I come back from that meeting and I had an old answering machine and I play back my answering machine and there was a, a call to me from a man by the name of Howard Lutzoff. Mm -hmm. And Howard Lutzoff was calling me because he wanted to take our information on cocaethylene to support a poly drug dependency patent that, I, that he was filing for this drug from Africa called Ibogaine. And at that point, I was, what is this drug? How does it work? What's the mechanism of action? What do you know about it? I need to hear about this. This is you? And he said, yes, I have four patents filed. One for opioid, and opioid addiction, psychostimulants, alcohol, nicotine, and now I'm filing polydrug. I said, okay. <laughs> um, what can you tell me? And he said, I will come down to Miami and I will bring my data. I said, please do so. Come down. I want to hear about this. He comes down to Miami with his wife, Norma Alexander. He brings me a box of papers, kind of junky papers, newspaper mm -hmm. articles, clippings, anecdotal information about the drug. Sure. I look at it. It's not data. You know, anecdote is not the plural of data. Right. Um, he had a lot of anecdotes. But he had two things that I wanted. He invited me to see it with my own eyes. He invited mm -hmm. me to go to Amsterdam, where he was working with a group who were running a kind of underground railroad of addicts helping addicts mm -hmm. called the International Coalition of Addicts Self-Help and the Dutch Addicts Self-Help Movement, both mm -hmm. of those groups together. And he also had a Belgium manufacturing company that were experts in natural products Right. who were manufacturing the Ivy game, according to good manufacturing practice. Something you would need if you were going to test this in an academic medical center. Sure. So I, I'm a pharmacologist. I need an MD. So I go to my colleague, Dr. Juan Sanchez Ramos, an MD, PhD in the Department of Neurology, and I said, Juan, will you get on an airplane with me? I'll buy the tickets. Let's go to Amsterdam. Let's see this. I go to Amsterdam. I see three men go through the treatment. First of all, when I got to Amsterdam, I thought I had lost my mind because it was not a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. um, there was a psychiatrist there who was straight out of a, um, a Fellini movie. <laughs> Um, there was this whole entourage of Lutzoff's people. Um, it was just not, it was not what, it was not academic. It was not scientific. It was not clinical. It was something from a movie. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm there. And there was a group of reporters there too at the time and other people. It was a whole group of people. And I met the young men who were going to go through the treatment and there were three young men and I will go to my grave with this, with this experience because there was a young man, Mark, who had, was on hundred milligrams of methadone. He was taking benzodiazepines. He would chip on heroin on occasion mm -hmm. and it really struggled with addiction for a very, very long time. And a remarkable young man, just a remarkable, remarkable young man really suffered. Another young man who was young, a musician, a Puerto Rican musician, very talented, spectacular, also had a horrible heroin addiction. And the third young man was the son of an Orthodox rabbi from New York mm. who had struggled with cocaine addiction okay. and had severe attention deficit disorder and was self-medicating with cocaine as a psychostimulant. All right. 
So these three men are in three separate rooms. They give them the Ibogaine. There's no crash carts. There's no cardiac monitors. There's no ID lines. There's nothing. But I sat at the bed and I stayed up all night long at the bed of these three men. And I went from room to room. Everybody else went to sleep, but I was there. There were no nurses either. So I helped these men. I gave them water, whatever I could do, you know, <laughs> be present for them mm -hmm. while going through this. And, but I had an idea. And I said to Boaz Wachtel, a young man, an Israeli who was part of the Let's Off entourage, I said, Boaz, these young men will give me urine samples. Go get me dry ice, styrofoam container, and urine cups. And he did. And I collected urine. And I sat up with these young men, and I watched these young men transform. No withdrawals get up out of the bed the next day, eat a full meal, go shower, shave, clean up, and sit down across the table and tell me what was going to be different in their life and tell me how good they felt. And I stayed with them for the next few days. So I got to watch their transformation. And I said, what is this? What is this? There has to be an explanation, and I have to go home, and I have to tell others what I just saw. Mm -hmm. So I did. I gave, but the first thing was I had to get that box of urine on the plane. <laughs> Always carry cash. I went to the airport in Amsterdam. I got my box of dry ice on the, on the flight, got to Miami. I got it off the plane, and I drove in my car to my colleague, Dr. Lee Hearn, who worked with me on the metabolite. Co-Kathleen, I handed him the box here and I said, Lee, get this on the gas chromatograph mass spec, show me the metabolite of Ibogaine. And that was the discovery of your Ibogaine. Fascinating, fascinating journey, especially. I, I, would, I would love to see what you said when you had the dry ice with the urine in it and getting on the plane, but uh, that must have been, it, it, it's clear, clearly a fascinating, um, a set of discoveries, let's put it that way, if, until that point. Now, if you, if you will, take us from there. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, you, you spoke about, um, obviously, this long, you know, this wasn't something that, you know, accidentally, like Albert Hoffman and LSD, boom, it, it, it appeared in the lab. You have a long sort of ethnomedicinal, phytochemical, phytomedicinal use in West Africa. Gabon, Cameroon, Congo, and so forth, used for religious ceremonies, various spiritual uh, undertakings and what have you. Um, we get the, the substance and the metabolite back to the United States. Yeah. You're a pharmacologist, you're in pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, and so forth. Um, take us now to that point where, okay, um, there's a, you've studied these amazing properties. I want to talk a little bit more about that. From what you found in the lab, but now you're going into this um, uh, this gauntlet, let's say, of FDA and DEA, where on one hand you have an amazing potential clinical set of clinical trials to run in the early 1990s on the substance, uh, but it's still a scheduled one substance, and DEA wants to smack you down at every particular point, and from even getting in, you know, playing with this stuff. Take us a little bit through that journey, because that's really an, another fascinating part of the progression of this story, I think. First of all, all right, so I get the, you know, the, the great idea that, one, I immediately had to tell my colleagues at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, because they were my boss. I, I'm, I'm reporting to, not, to the NIH NIDA. I'm an NIH-funded investigator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, universities are kind of like medieval stalls, you know? They don't support the research. They give you a place where you can sell your wares, and you have to sell your wares to the funding agencies and the NIH. I always told my staff in my laboratory, our boss, I mean, yes, the University of Miami is my boss. I have a chairman, et cetera. But really, our boss is the NIH. Mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. I have a, a duty to report back to, to my boss, which is the NIH. So I did that. And the NIH and NIDA, and, and keep in mind, I was an unknown at NIDA at the time because I was a brand new investigator for them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I wasn't an established NIDA investigator. Here's this woman from Miami. She's got, you know, she has a flash in the pan with coca ethylene. And probably a lot of people in the in and my colleagues and peers were like, who is this woman? Right. And now she wants to test Ibogaine. Oh, oh, good. That oh great, you know. And and my personality is such that if I want to do something, I will do it. It's just how I roll. You know, it's my, I don't know why I'm like this, but I get anyway. that from you, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to do this, right? So I go, I go first, and I also go, I had a wonderful, I was very, very fortunate at the time too, because I had a fantastic dean of research. My dean of research at the University of Miami was a, a man by the name of Dr. Bob Rubin. And you could not have asked for a better research dean than this man. This man loved science as much as all of us. Uh, he had his own laboratory. He was brilliant. He is brilliant. And he just supported his faculty. He wanted his faculty. So when I, and I had a good track record because I was getting funding. So I went to Dr. Rubin. I explained all of this to him. And I said, I understand if we're going to do a clinical trial at the University of Miami, you know, this is a schedule one drug. It is untested. It'll be a new clinical trial. So Dr. Rubin said, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll do it. We'll go behind you, Deborah." So he paved the way for me with the university, and the university was excellent. Um, I went up in front of the insurance carriers. We presented. He gave me resources. He gave me people to help me with drafting of the protocols for the FDA and whatnot. Resources were put in, put on my on the table for me, mm -hmm. us, our group of collaborators at the medical school. So that was number one. If with, without the university behind us, we wouldn't be able to do it. I went up to the NIH. I had been invited to NIDA by. Um, Dr. Charles Grzynskis and Frank Focci, who were heading up the Medication Development Division at NIDA, mm -hmm. to give a talk on cocaethylene. By now, I'm totally burned out on cocaethylene. Plus, I've seen Ibogaine do this remarkable transformation. And I go in there and I give my talk. And then afterwards, I, I tell Dr. Vachi and, and Dr. Grzynskis, I said, you know, University of Miami is going to file an IND for Ibogaine. I don't know this to be true, but I, I pretty much believe that when I turned around to leave, that the two of them cracked up laughing, that they laughed at me and said, this woman, forget about it. She's never going to get that done. I'm certain. I'm fairly certain that this is true. <laughs> um, in fact, I should ask Frank Vachi if he was laughing that day. He'd probably tell me the truth. So I come back to Miami. We write the IND, we submit it to the FDA. The FDA was highly collaborative. The medical safety officers, all of the people at the FDA were so collaborative and so wonderful to us. I, my experience with FDA was always good. Mm -hmm. And I'm an, here I am, I'm an anomaly. I'm, I don't have a big pharmaceutical company behind me. I don't have a track record of clinical trials in addiction at the University of Miami. There were a lot of negatives, yes. Schedule one drug, mm -hmm. Howard Lutzoff, who wasn't the most collaborative and cooperative person with National Institute on Drug Abuse and other people. It just was the way he operated. And including the University of Miami. But nonetheless, we persevered. And in 1993, we got approval for the first clinical trial in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that was such a huge accomplishment, we couldn't believe it. But it was very difficult because we went up in front of what was called the Drug Abuse Advisory Committee of the FDA. And we had to convince our colleagues and peers. And that day was a free-for-all. Um, it, it really was a free-for-all because we had an open meeting. I allowed everybody to come. I was so excited about this because I had, you know, seeing is believing and I had seen it and I, I wanted to do the right thing and I wanted stakeholders involved and I wanted the collaboration and it, it wasn't my ego or the ego of our, of our group down in Miami. We really wanted to share and I shared. I, I shared the discovery of the, met, the metabolite immediately with NIDA. Immediately, I gave all the data that we had. 
because you know we needed to work with the, we needed to work with NIDA if we were going to do this. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to pay for the clinical trial. Put it that way. So we go in there, and um, the meeting was terrible because, for a lot of reasons, it was kind of a, a crazy meeting because Howard lots off. There were demonstrations of uh, cures, not wars. There were people picketing outside the FDA. It was all kinds of crazy things going on. The media was mm -hmm. there. It was really a circus. But one of the damning things was uh, an investigator that was a, a NIDA-funded contract investigator by the name of, name of Mark Molliver, who came in with this idea that high-dose Ibogaine would cause cerebellar toxicity, would damage brain, would damage neurons in the brain. And rodents were, this was shown in rats. Now, I had done monkeys down in St. Kitts, where I had been working mm -hmm. on a grant funded by NIAAA, by the Alcohol Institute, and working with the late Frank Irvin, who, a uh, biological psychiatrist, and also Roberta Palmer, and I had been down there, so I had veterinarians, and we had a whole thing with monkeys down there. Sure. And um, so I asked Frank to give me some monkeys, which he did, he gave me monkeys. We dosed monkeys repeatedly with Idagain. And then I brought the brains back. We did full necropsies on the animals. And I brought the brains back to Miami. And I gave them to neuropathologists because I had the brain bank. So I had working with wonderful neuropathologists by the name of Dr. Michael Norenberg and his collaborators in, in that division. Mm -hmm. And I said, Michael, will you help me? Michael had helped me for many years on many different things. And I said, Michael, will you help me? Will you look at these monkeys? And by the way, he was an expert um, on uh, cerebellar damage because he mm -hmm. had been studying hepatic encephalopathy. So the guy really was an expert. And I said, look at these brains and you tell me if there are any dead neurons in these monkeys because I need to tell the FDA and I, don't, we, I need to report this. We need to know. We don't want to hurt anybody. Yes. So I knew it didn't do anything in monkeys. This we got to, nothing, nothing. Doses that would be given to human, the high doses that would be given to human were free of any toxicity in monkey. So, and humans, Dr. I worked in a neurology department, and Juan Sanchez Ramos, mm -hmm. who was an, a, a phenomenal, he is a phenomenal neurologist in what? Movement disorders. We were doing posturography, very sophisticated testing of motor and cerebellar function. So we had Ibogaine patients, patients who took high doses of Ibogaine for detox, and we had all this neurological safety. Right. So we felt good about this, and we presented that to, to NIDA and the FDA, and everybody you know, got to see these data. So I was pretty confident about that. And, um, but the meeting wasn't going well, because when you raise a neurotoxic flag, uh, uh-oh, you know, it's a big uh -oh. So I looked around the room, I'd really had enough of it, and I said, I don't even know how, to be honest, I don't even know how I knew to do this, but I said, meeting closed. <laughs> Everybody out. The Drug Abuse Advisory Committee, lots off in his group out, University of Miami in, and I looked around the room and I said, that regulatory attorney who's with Howard lots off, he can stay in and listen. Everybody else out. And we went into closed door. And we stayed there for hours. Hours and hours. I think everybody was burned out, including my colleagues from UM. And finally, there was a kind of a, a motion made by one of the women, uh, an RN, I believe, an RN who may have been in recovery. I, I don't remember all the details at the time, but a really um, a compassionate, clever lady who sort of made a motion. And at the time, I was an elected official in municipal government, so I knew something about parliamentary procedure. I grabbed the microphone, said to the chairman of the DAC, Mr. Chairman, you have a motion on the floor. Let me restate the motion. The motion is to allow us to go forward in Ibogaine veterans. We got a second, and that meeting gave us the open door. Mm -hmm. And there's another legendary person from that meeting, and his name is Dr. Curtis Wright, who was one of the guardians of helping us to put together a, a careful, safe, proper protocol to test Ibogaine safety and pharmacokinetics in humans to start the phase one. Mm -hmm. In 1995, I went back to the FDA. There were a lot of things that transpired between all of this. 
But one problem was that Howard Lotsoff had a death. And it was the death of a young woman in the Netherlands who was a healthy young woman who died from unknown causes that may, have, may or may not have been related to Ibogaine. And her mother um, showed up in my office in Miami, a German woman, and unannounced and flew in from Germany and came to my office to meet me and said, I want to know why my daughter died. And I said, I do too. So with her permission, we were able to get that autopsy information from the doctors who did mm -hmm. the autopsy. And we provided that information to the FDA because at that time, we recognized that we should probably slow down. We had to understand now we had two critical issues that we needed to sort out. I wasn't worried about the cerebellar toxicity at all. I knew that that was, would not be an issue going mm -hmm. forward. But the um, toxicity, the blood levels of Ibogaine, we needed to understand more about that. Sure. And of course, that's what a phase one is for. You're going to slowly walk up the dose in, in small increments. You're going to you'll look at the adverse event profile. You'll get the pharmacokinetics. You'll you'll understand how to how to dose the drug before right. you start giving it to patients for detoxification. Howard had no information. You know, they, they were flying by the seat of their pants, to say it gently. So we figure that out. We, we solved that riddle. Uh, we understand what happened. It was an accidental overdose for that young woman. We present that information to the FDA in the form of an amendment. And something else happened. I told Howard Lutzoff, I said, you cannot give Ibogaine in settings that are unsafe you have to be in a hospital mm -hmm. it has to be given under full medical monitor mm -hmm. give it under full medical monitor you'll be fine you'll never have an adverse event please don't do that anymore so i then went and got approval i got a medical doctor from panama who had a hospital and could get a whole wing to be dedicated for this i said howard you're going to write an I, you're going to do it. You're going to get a, a, a approval from the hospital. You're going to have mm -hmm. Ibogaine by a, a licensed medical doctor. And your patients will come to Miami. They will get off the plane. They will be evaluated by University of Miami medical doctors mm -hmm. and psychologists. They'll go to Panama. They'll take Ibogaine under medical monitor. You'll get safety and blood levels from the patients, we'll draw bloods, Miami will analyze them, then they'll come back to Miami and we'll evaluate them and then they'll go home. We'll submit that data to the update. Good idea, we did that. And so we collected some data from that. We submitted that to the FDA and we learned more about the pharmacokinetics and the safety. Mm -hmm. And something else happened, a young woman who had come to Miami, she had been treated with Ibogaine, she had two doses um, a small dose and the, and the detox dose the year before. She had done very well, and then she relapsed a year out. She wanted to go back to take, to take the drug again because she felt the drug really helped her. But again, she had struggled with addiction for a very long time. She was a heroin uh, user, mm -hmm. IV drug user. Very smart young woman, very, very, uh, an accountant, very smart, lovely young woman and wanted to kick the habit 100%. She wanted out. I don't, want to be an, I don't want to be addicted to heroin anymore. I want out. And she was convinced that Ibogaine would give her that, that she had done well the first time. She, she realized why she relapsed, and she wanted to go again, and this time it was going to stick. She came down to Miami. Full neurologic evaluation, of course. Labs, clinical labs, evaluation, posturography. And she had taken Ibogaine before, so we knew she had no neurological deficit. Mm -hmm. Goes down, takes the drug, um, comes back to Miami. When she gets to Miami, she didn't feel good. She said, Dr. Mesh, I don't feel good. I, feel, I don't know if I'm going through withdrawals or if I got the flu or what's going on. So I called my colleague, uh, who was an internist, and I, and I said, do me a favor. Admit her for one day. Mm -hmm. Just to observe. He said, I don't think there's anything wrong with her. She's not going through withdrawals for sure. She, maybe she picked up a bug. She might have a little flu. She might be a little dehydrated. I'm, I'm going to give her fluids and we'll watch her. So we did that. Brought her in, checked her out, gave her fluids. She left. She goes back up to New York. 
She was in New York for about three and a half weeks. And she called me up and she said, Dr. Mash, I'm getting out of New York. I don't want to be in this place anymore. Bad memories. I've got uh, someone who will sponsor me in Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to move down to Fort Lauderdale. And if possible, can I volunteer and work for you and uh, do some work for you? And I said, absolutely. You come down, come down to South Florida. You want to work with us, you know, kind of be in the mix. You'll get, you know, you'll work with your counselor. You can be part of, we have sort of an Ibogaine support group going in mm-hmm. Miami. And I said, you can be with the family in Miami. Absolutely. Come on down. She eats sushi on a Thursday. On Friday morning, she doesn't feel good. She has some nausea and vomiting. She gets on an airplane. She flies down to Miami. She goes with her friend to his house, continues with nausea and vomiting. And the next day she gets up and she dies. She was a Broward County medical examiner. I get the phone call that she had passed away. I immediately called the medical examiner's office. I said, this woman has taken an experimental drug. I have a full chart on her. We have all of her medical records and notes. May I come down and be present at the autopsy? And they knew me because remember, I had been working with the medical examiners mm-hmm. in Data Broward County. So I had grant from NIDA and I was you know, doing my other grants. Sure. So they knew me and they knew me with the brain bank and everything else. And I said, also, if I have your permission, may I take the brain and may we at the University of Miami do the neuropathology on the brain? Because very important, she's taken four doses of Ibogaine. If there's any cerebellar toxicity or toxicity of the brain, we would like to know this so we could tell the FDA. Sure. They said, Deborah, come on down. So I was present at the autopsy. It was quite a day. Imagine. Quite a day. I knew Nancy. I had met with her. She had done her MRI in Miami. And I, I can remember sitting out there on the bench in front of the MRI center. And I asked, I, we had a conversation about donating your brain. I said, you know, you're pioneers. You're like astronauts. Oh, you're by Bogonauts. You're going up in the spaceship. God forbid, if anything ever happens to you, you need to donate your brain. Mm-hmm. To medical research and of course I told a lot of people to donate their brain because I'm the founder let past I am the founder and past director of the University of Miami Brain Endowment Bank one of the largest collections of human brains mm-hmm. that day everything I knew about brains was important sure. as I brought her brain back to the University of Miami and we processed it Nancy's brain was clean there was no pathology Nancy died from causes unrelated to Ibogaine. We presented all of that to the FDA. Mm-hmm. And we went back into the meeting with the FDA with the revised protocol. And in 1995, the FDA gave us the full green light to go forward with an external data safety monitoring committee. Uh, it was fantastic. I mean, it was the best news of the day. And I, I was so proud of what we had done. Absolutely. You know, it was really... Um, it was a great day. I had Nida in the room with me. I invited my colleagues. I had Dr. Gridges was sitting right next to me. Dr. Vachi was on the review panel, so he was sitting at the table. And when we finished that meeting, Dr. Sanchez Ramos was with me. We were there, the UM people. When we finished the meeting, I leaned over to Dr. Grzynskis and I said, okay, FDA just gave us the full green light. Will Nida fund the study? And they had come down and visited us, and we thought we might have a contract. In fact, then NIDA gave contracts in the Medication Development Division. Mm -hmm. And they told me to write a grant. No contract. So I came home, and I did what I do, which is to write a grant. Mm -hmm. And I submitted the grant. And the grant was not scored. uh, And that was a big surprise to me because... We had so, we had fantastic collaborators. Absolutely. Yes. Not only did we have our collaborators at UM that were terrific, but we had UCSF. We had the best pharmacokineticists in the entire country, number one. We had Rachel Tyndale for the genotyping to work out all the, the pharmacokinetics and the metabolism. Mm-hmm. She was in the front end at the University of Toronto, looking at the cytochromes and characterizing cytochromes. Mm -hmm. 
And I can remember that woman talking to me, very brilliant. She's one of the smartest women I've ever met in my life. And she looked at the molecule and she goes, Deborah, this is CYP2D6. She knew immediately what enzyme was involved. She was right. And we were going to prove it. So we did that. Um, so I had all these people, collaborators, and then we had people from uh, the armed services, uh, uniformed armed services uh, group that were going to help us with the, uh, with the neuropsychology. We had counselors, therapists. Oh, my goodness. We, had, we were dressed up for the party. We mm -hmm. had everybody on board. But the thing that was so tragic here was, you know, when you write a grant, you, your grant may not be perfect. Right. They never are. In fact, very rarely you get funded on first submission. However, you get scored and then you revise it, right? You, you, get a, you get your feedback from the review panel. In this case, the, fa the feedback was don't darken our doorstep with this grant. No. Not for what's called nerfed. Not for further consideration. No. And keep in mind that I've had funding from the NIH for over three decades. Mm -hmm. I'm still collaborating on NIH grants today yeah. as I sit here talking to you. So it's not my first rodeo, and I did have some experience with it, and I served on review panels. So I understood, you know, I understood the process of peer review. So this was a clear message that um, they didn't want to see this. Right. You know, I had, and the message, loud and clear. So NIDA decided that they were going to do their own IDA game, IND. And they put together a panel, uh, external advisors and whatnot, and we participated in Miami on that. I didn't really know the full extent of this, obviously, because I wasn't uh, in the in the you know in the bunker from NIDA's uh, group to understand what was going on there. All I knew is I, we had approval to go forward, and we had no funding. Right. But I'm a collaborator. Sure. I'm a team player, and you know, and and in my heart, I wanted. I wanted it to be tested. Right. I believed then, as I do today, that given the magnitude of the problem of addiction in our society, that we in the scientific community need to leave no stone unturned. Absolutely. And I saw this work. They know it works. They've seen it. They have the animal data. There was, as you pointed out, a more than 100 years of ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology around this molecule. Mm -hmm. It was marketed under the trade name of Lamborghini in France for many years in mm -hmm. low doses. We knew when you take a low dose of Ibogaine that really you're being exposed to nor Ibogaine right. because there's a huge first pass metabolism. So all those people walking around with low dose Ibogaine in their blood had done the experiment with nor Ibogaine. Right. If there had been adverse events, it would have been out, off the market. Yes. Absolutely. All right. So now we have no money. And Howard Lotsoff had the IP. We had no IP. Howard Lotsoff had, had the IP. I couldn't do this in the public sector with NIH funding. Mm-hmm. There was no real foundation support, except for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. Right. When Rick Doblin called me the first time, I hung up on him. <laughs> but he'll tell you that. I, I was like, what? Rick Doblin, MAPS? No. <laughs> no, don't, don't call me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, no. <laughs> we're, we're legitimate, legitimate scientists. Rick right. Doblin has MD, he's more legitimate. He has MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or as we call it, ecstasy, all the way up to phase three clinical trials. Right. The man is a force of nature. I have terrific respect for him. Um, but at the time, you know, I was, I was, you know, you're right, the DEA, we had a DEA Schedule One license. We took this all very, very seriously. And Ibogaine has no abuse liability, unlike the others in the Schedule One category. Mm -hmm. Nobody's abusing Ibogaine. Right. So we tried to do everything by the book, and, but we had no money. So it was really, I, I didn't know what to do. And Lutzoff couldn't fund it. He could never fund it. 
yet he controlled the IP. Mm-hmm. So where do you go? So I thought about it, and when we had the NIDA had the external review meeting, and this is 1995 now, I came out of that meeting. The group was not going to approve the study. It was split pretty much uh, between academia and industry advisors. And some people had said noribogaine would be the better molecule than ibogaine. I was in the audience. I was presenting. I heard the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, people, we went out of that meeting. It was clear that probably this was not going to go forward in the U.S., at least from NIDA was, would decide not to go forward, which is what happened. So NIDA didn't pursue their own, um, their own clinical studies. I was sitting there with FDA approval, full green light, no money. Mm-hmm. And uh, where do you go? What do you do? And there were two young men there from Goldman Sachs. And I didn't have any plans for dinner because I wasn't invited to the after party with NIDA. So the Goldman Sachs boys came up to me and said, Dr. Mash, will you join us for dinner? And I went, yeah, sure. I have nowhere to go. Let's go. So I go to dinner and we start talking about the possibility of funding this thing. Right. And my brain goes to plan B. Mm-hmm. And I'd never done anything like this. I couldn't walk away from this. Sure. There were too many people suffering, and I I just believed that this maybe could be an answer for some. Absolutely. So we started two companies. Uh, one that would be a shell company to hold the intellectual property, the new IP around the nor I began around the metabolite. And I went back to my friends in, in St. Kitts offshore, and mm-hmm. I went to Dr. Frank Urban. And I said, Dr. Urban, will you help me? I had, you wouldn't believe it, Ira, because we had so much publicity around the Ibogaine and, of course, media around the FDA and everything else. I had a notebook of letters, people who wrote to me begging for help. Hundreds and hundreds of letters. Dr. Mash, if you have a clinical trial, can I be a volunteer? Mm -hmm. So we went to government at St. Kitts and this, we were lucky because we had Dr. Irvin, a biological, you know, a bio, a biological psychiatrist, mm-hmm. he my mentor at Harvard, a legend, a visionary, a cynic, you know, the perfect person to be the clinical director of an R&D program in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And he had a great reputation. He had the monkey, you know, he had the monkey facility there. Right. The primate center. And he was very well respected by the government. So he got me a, a wonderful local doctor who um, had studied in the UK, mm-hmm. Dr. Kathleen Allen Ferdinand, her husband, who was our attorney. Mm-hmm. And we had a dinner party with the prime minister who himself a doctor, Dr. Denzel Douglas, the head of the Ministry of Health in St. Kitts, mm-hmm. head of tourism, many of the government officials. I hosted a closed-door dinner party. Always keep your visa card with you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had to pick up that, that, that dinner party. And they didn't take American Express. And um, I fed the bodyguards too. So everybody, we all ate. And I sat next to prime minister. And at the end of the dinner, I leaned over to him and I said, Dr. Douglas, what do you think? Can we go forward? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Deborah, it will be done. So government approved us. Excellent. And we were allowed to bring a schedule one drug into the government pharmacy in St. Kitts. And let me just uh, interrupt here for a minute, because I think this is putting perspective for me, because here we are in 2019. um, And it's a very different, let's say, global pharmaceutical research environment now. We have all sorts of uh, conditional approval pathways in, in Japan for, you know, stem cell therapies. And in China, there's, uh, you know, there are specific uh, medical tourism zones. A lot of this stuff, okay, it's 2019. But here you are, again, you know, I'm just trying to put this in perspective with how far ahead of the curve you were on on these things, 
1995. All this stuff's unheard of. And yet you are, you know, you in essence are creating the first sort of offshore pharmaceutical research slash medical tourism model, which basically, you know, 25 years later, now many drug companies are adopting in the way they do things. So I, I think I just want to throw that out there because I, it's an amazing, in my opinion, part of the story as well, just to show that, you know, aside from all the science you do, uh, you know, you're, your, your politics also, and you know that there's many parts of this puzzle to get things done. And I, I just think it's really fascinating. Sorry for interrupting, but um, now Healing Visions is created. You're in St. Kitts. Tell us about that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> St. Kitts. Um, in some ways, my pride and humility of that experience mm -hmm. is the most fundamental of my life. The first treatments that we did in St. Kitts, I can name off all six people who were there. Mm -hmm. I held my breath. We really had the most remarkable um, group of people. We learned so much. Mm -hmm. And the first group of people we had, there were four. Um, heroin dependent patients mm -hmm. and two cocaine dependent patient volunteers. There were two women, there were four men. We didn't charge the women any money to come down there. Okay. They were scholarship like almost 100%. Um, we had a sliding fee for service scale down there. We had counselors and researchers and doctors and more doctors and psychiatrists and and internists and you know because we knew nothing I mean this was really well we knew some things but you know now you're really going to do it now you're really going to treat patients mm -hmm. and of course patient safety I mean I learned more cardiology than I ever wanted to learn in my life because I watched cardiac monitors Absolutely. it was remarkable but what I think one of the best things was Dr. Irvin our clinical director who came into me at the end of the first round of patients and looked at me with his eye, glasses down on his nose and he said, well, Deborah, it blocks opioid withdrawals. <laughs> and it did, <laughs> and it did. And we knew that and I'd seen it before, but now we showed it again. Right. And so that, that remarkable experience and of course um that's where the the safety where we really were able to collect open label safety and efficacy information mm -hmm. and provide that back to the fda and, and publish on it share it with our colleagues and collaborators right but you know that and we had spoken and i had the opportunity i think i spoke i met you and during that period and mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm thinking about sourcing and the drug and, and, and ways to get the natural product to Ibogaine and as a, 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 an abundant product to go into humans, how we would do that. And there was, the learning curve was amazing. We, we helped a lot of people. I still get, I get flowers on Mother's Day and, and, and cards and letters from people who say, Dr. Mash, thank you, you gave me back my life. You can't. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, and you and you can't even begin to know how that inspires me today. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I can't let this go. Yeah. I can't let it go, especially when you have we have what we have going on today. Mm -hmm. I know what this could be for people. We have to do it safely. We have to do it according to what the regulatory authorities want us to do. We need to get in the clinic. We need to test this. It needs to be done right. Absolutely. And what we learned from St. Kitts to just kind of wrap it all up mm -hmm. is that Ibogaine is a very powerful and gentle detox. Not only does it block signs, symptoms of withdrawal, but it gets converted to the active metabolite, nor Ibogaine, which has a longer half-life in the blood. That seems to bring about a neurochemical reset in the brain. Mm -hmm. It acts on strategic targets. It's a multi-target approach, much like what we, we see the GABAergic reset with allopregnanolone, which has shown tremendous efficacy for treating a postpartum depression in women. Mm -hmm. 
ibogaine is a similar kind of neurochemical reset. And the noribogaine, which stays long, longer term, has much longer half-life than, than ibogaine, also acts on the opioid system. It's a biased kappa agonist. What does that mean? It's helping to, to, to change opioid tolerance in the cells themselves, also elevates serotonin, also acts on the part of the brain that puts the brakes on drug reward. Mm -hmm. So again, this fits in with modern neuroscience and neuropharmacology and what we've learned from the decades of seminal research study that has come out of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So as a, a neuropharmacologist sitting here in the chair, I love these drugs. Absolutely. I love learning about these drugs. At, clinically, um, you know, after many years of St. Kitts, it was time to wrap, get, back in, get, get back on shore. Right. And that's what leads us to Demrex and, and the uh, founding of that corporation. Now, awesome. going a, first to develop Noribogaine. Okay. Take us through all of that. Because, you know, aside from your scientist hat, aside from your clinician hat now, you, I know you as a, an extremely accomplished a uh, hard-charging businesswoman as well. So now take us into your transition into the world of Biotech 101, U.S. side, and your experiences, successes, hurdles, um, and, and where you're going with it. Because I know aside, as you just mentioned, aside from this major problem we have nowadays, billions and billions of dollars of opiate addiction and other substance abuse, you also, as you mentioned, you're potentially sitting on a pharmacological reset uh, opportunity for many central nervous system disorders, whether that's depression or uh, other comorbidities. Take us through all that because uh, you know, you're really leading the path again into the future on this front. Where are you going with it? Tell us the future. So I had, um, when I decided that enough of uh, St. Kitts and we needed to bring this home to Americans, mm -hmm. I, started to put together, as you said, biotech startup 101. Mm -hmm. And really I was unskilled, completely unskilled in all of that. Um, however, I did have a meeting with Novartis and I did have discussion with Sanofi. And that at that time they were working on the cannabinoid receptor antagonist. And remember, they were developing it for obesity, and they had in the back of their mind, they were going to go after addiction with this molecule. But unfortunately, it had the little problem of a black box warning and suicidality Ooh. when you antagonize uh, the cannabinoid receptors. So at the time, there was a lot of um, disinterest in CNS pharmacology starting to emerge and blockbuster drugs were being developed along vaccines, Viagra, diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, the blockbuster drugs were not in the brain. Right. So Novartis, who I met with, and I met with their head of licensing, I went over to uh, Zurich. Right. He met me, came over from Basel, came on the train, sat with me for half a day, talked to me, Dr. Javier Lataste and said, I'm gonna bring this back in, but I want you to go in front of the FDA. I want you to have a pre-IND meeting. So I did that. I set up a pre-IND meeting with the FDA for noribogaine. And again, the FDA, here's this academic investigator coming in with a new chemical entity now. The FDA was great. And I went up in front of that committee and, and, and got their guidance on what I would need to do with noribogaine, which was basically, Deborah, we're gonna, they were very clear, we're gonna treat you no different than any other pharmaceutical company. So get the message. Right. All right. So we got that message and now I need to, I need to launch. And um, I was rescued by a group called Springboard. Springboard launches women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a woman from Africa had sent me an email um, who knew me and she was running a, um, drug manufacturing unit out of Ghana. And she said, Deborah, you need to contact this group Springboard. So I did. I sent my information into Springboard. And Springboard, the way they act, it's very fast. They said, um, 
give me, you know, they, you send up a synopsis, they look at it, they, they ask for your business plan, you better get it there in a couple days. I sent, submitted the business plan, and then they said, all right, we want, want to meet with you in New York. So I got on a plane, I flew up, and I was selected, our company was selected as for the boot camp, and they launched me. And then I was, you know, developing my elevator pitch and, and, and really learning how to do this and talk to investors. And that was a great experience. Actually, that made me a better grant writer. If you can sell your ideas in one page mm -hmm. and raise money, you can write a better NIH grant. And so that, that really helped me scientifically back in my academic game. But um, this was remarkable, and I loved it. And it was at that time that I met Steve Gorlin, and um, I had my first investor, the Ross family, wrote the first million-dollar check, and Demerex was formed. And today, Demerex has been reorganized, mm -hmm. and we've brought back both molecules, Ibogaine and Noribogaine, and we are a clinical stage drug development company. I've got new management, a new team around me, a wonderful vice president for clinical trials and regulatory affairs. We've identified our clinical trial site. And the next step is to work with the health authorities in the US and elsewhere to commence three pivotal studies for Ibogaine and Noribogaine running simultaneously, mm -hmm. We're raising money to do this, and then we will move into a phase two clinical trial. And I believe that we're gonna succeed. I believe that we will demonstrate that the drugs can be given safely, that we will understand the therapeutic blood levels, and that we will be able to make this available to patients. And you know what we learned in St. Kitts, what my counselors and therapists told me, is that Ibogaine is an adjuvant to psychotherapy. Ibogaine is very powerful because it helps patients to develop insights into their destructive behaviors. If you think about addiction, addiction is very difficult to treat. We don't have a lot of medicines to treat addiction. Right. It's not a single target drug. You're going to need a combination of drugs. And that's why Ibogaine or Ibogaine is so unique right. in this space because it's got the right mix of molecular targets. It's hitting multiple sites in the brain. You know, you look at our veterans who are taking a cocktail of four, five, six, seven drugs right. to treat their PTSD, their addiction, and their blast injury. Here we are. We know Ibogaine is a bit of a cognition enhancer. Mm. We've got that neuropsych data. We know that it diminishes cravings and desire to use. We know it blocks signs of withdrawal. Just go on the internet and you can read all the testimonials there. So we can do this. We just need the help of our partners at the FDA and elsewhere in other countries so that we can test this, we can demonstrate safety, and we can move into pivotal efficacy studies and, and provide that data for external peer review and, and bring the drug products and make them available. Ibogaine has to be administered under full medical monitor, mm -hmm. nor Ibogaine can be developed, we believe, for office-based practice. And we also believe that we can develop noribogaine for prison use. Mm -hmm. Extremely exciting. Um, extremely exciting. And the, you know, one of the thing I, I've always admired in the story is that <laughs> from everything you've already spoken about is sort of this, um, you know, looking beyond, you know, you, you used to describe it to me, you know, this is not a sniper rifle, this is like a shotgun effect, and there's so much pharmacology and so much going on at different targets, but really this move beyond this uh, single magic bullet philosophy that, uh, you know, pharma has used the last hundred years to really the development of uh, these products that have what I'll refer to as these combinatorial effects. And um, really with the understanding that, uh, you know, this is a world of systems and systems biology and, and the old approach might yeah. not work as some of these newer approaches and that you're championing this is just another, I take my hat off to you if I had a hat on, <laughs> um, but you really a, a pioneered on so many different fronts. And, and I definitely I believe and everyone watching believe that you, you will clearly get there and, and uh, that you have persevered so much and brought the story this far. Uh, it is obviously going to get there and definitely behind you 100%.
Um, I guess, you know, getting back to just Deborah Mash, I mean, you've spoken, you know, a lot about influencers uh, throughout your uh, career and your education, the people that have guided you and have kept you on this path. Um, we, we usually ask a question on this show, sort of more of a science fiction related question, but uh, it's sort of about the people that you uh, would have wanted to meet. And if I had this ability to to put Dr. Deborah Mash in my time machine over here and send you anywhere you wanted to go, uh, who are some of those folks that, uh, you know, from past eras that have inspired you that, you know, you would, might have wanted to sit down, have a cup of coffee with, have a dinner with, and, and just talk to for a little while. Oh, who would uh, come to my dinner party? Well, I can okay. tell you straight away. Okay. Um, yeah. Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. Definitely would want him at the party. I would love to have host a dinner party for, for Herr Professor Einstein. Um, I would love to have Marie Curie there. Mm -hmm. I would just love to have her there. And I would enjoy having Master Jesus there. Okay. One of the greatest world historical individuals on the planet, no doubt about it. And uh, I'd be curious to hear what he thought of the science. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, I would, from a, because you gotta always have a good politician, I think Abraham Lincoln would be great to have at the table. Oh, wow. So it's a sort of a diversified class, but I wanna cover all the bases. Mm -hmm. Notice I have two, no, two Nobel laureates, uh -huh. man and a woman, a politician, and a world historical uh, leader that changed the minds of hundreds of millions of people. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to join at that table with you. <laughs> Well, you know, Deborah, I, it's really, you know, once again, I, we go back several years. Um, it, it's really been a pleasure to, to see you and listen to you again and, and, and hear about your passion behind this. Um, you know, really thanking you for everything you do and the fact that you have stayed with this. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we will help. You know, we will put a lot of links up to your work and, and so forth. Um, we'll try to help you get the message out as, as wide as possible. Uh, but clearly you are, uh, you're on the right path as I've always thought you are. Um, and, you know, wishing you the best. And, and once again, for everybody listening, um, it's been Dr. Deborah Mash, professor of neurology, molecular and cellular pharmacology at University of Miami, and also the founder and chief executive officer at Demrex, uh, really doing amazing things. If there's anyone that's going to break through with this massive drug addiction, this opiate problem, this other illicit and illicit drug problem we have in the world today and as we've discussed you know this is a a much wider sort of psychological problem with the world that we're sitting in today it's it's going to be a dr deborah mash so you know once again just thank you thank you so much for staying this path and uh anything you want any other messages you want to wrap up with i'm, I'm giving you the floor um once again thank you for joining us no i'm just very grateful thank you ira for your um interest in this story and topic it's been a long journey for me but uh i want to finish what i've started and uh god willing we'll get there no doubt no doubt. Deborah, thank you so much for thank you. Time.